by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our day in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. The song before our opening prayer will be number 555, 555. Father, hear the prayer we offer, nor for ease that prayer shall be, but for strength that we may ever live our lives courageously. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another day of life that you have given us. We're thankful for the opportunities that we've had today to gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ and learn more about your word, learn what we can do to be better servants of yours and hopefully bring others to you. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the avenue of prayer. Dear Lord, we're thankful that you have given us this ability to bring our petitions before you, before your throne. Dear Lord, we, we're thankful for all the blessings that you give to us each and every day that are too numerous to count. Dear Lord, and we ask your forgiveness when we take those blessings for granted. Dear Lord, we, we pray a, a, for a special blessing upon our country at this time, dear Lord. We pray for our leaders. We pray for us as citizens, dear Lord, that we can turn back to you and that our leaders will look to you once again for their guidance. Dear Lord, we, we pray that you will bless our church here at Bremen. Please bless our, our 
efforts to spread the borders of your kingdom. Please bless Chad as he labors here with us and especially bless our elders, dear Lord, and the difficult job that they have. Dear Lord, we pray that you will give those who are not yet Christians an opportunity to, to be saved, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray that you will give us opportunities to plant the seed of your word in their heart, dear Lord, so that they can hopefully one day go to, the have, go to heaven and be with you one day. Dear Lord, we are especially grateful for your son, Jesus. We're thankful for his love for us. We're thankful for his willingness to go to the cross and die that cruel death, shed his blood. Dear Lord, we're thankful that he was, he was willing to do that and that he was raised on that third day, dear Lord. We pray that you will, that you will forgive us of our sins. Please go with us through this service as we strive to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The song of invitation at the proper time will be number 275. Number 275 will be the song of invitation. And then before uh, Brother Chad comes this evening, we'll sing number 76. Number 76, and I invite you to stand. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountain, through the deep Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. Flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. I want to say that we had a wonderful weekend yesterday and uh, the better part of Friday. Very proud of our young folks. Uh, a lot of a lot of different things. In fact, I was telling one uh, young man today, I didn't even realize uh, some of the other things that he'd done until I saw a picture posted on Facebook that his mom had posted, and I didn't realize he had participated in some of those things. So. Uh, our young people really made the congregation proud, made their parents proud, uh, and they ought to be proud of themselves for the hard work that they put in. And I know Johnny's going to have uh, a lot more to say about that when he does his uh, presentation that he always does. But uh, I had the opportunity this, uh, this time to judge. And I, I was down for judging speech last year, but uh, they... The idea that they hoped for, and it happened that way last year, was to have more, more people in the room than they need judges. Now, that's a better problem to have than needing more judges and not having people in there. And it, uh, it didn't work out where they needed me last year. But this year they did, and a uh, funny thing happened because uh, Joshua, my Joshua, and Josh Chapman were speaking. And so I wanted to make sure I was judging what they call winner's circle. And Johnny's explained that before where uh, if someone wins uh, the speaking or certain, certain events, if you win, then you go to what is called the winner's circle. And it's, 
Uh, it just, just made it to be a little bit uh, kind of taking it up a notch, so to speak. So that happens after the regular speeches. So I, I get put into a group, and the fellow's going over all the instructions. He says, any questions? I, I raised my hand and said, hey, uh, any chance I could swap with someone who has winner's circle so I could go hear my boy? Well, a guy jumps up, and he says, I'll swap with him. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so I get there, and I sit down. I'm talking to these fellows, and I said, now, um, what time does winner's circle speech start? And they said, I don't know. And I said, you don't know? Oh, are we not in winter? No, no, this is just regular speech. <laughs> well, the guy that had swapped with me, he was basically in the same speech I was, just a different grade. And so then I said, okay, if I finally got Spin Broom recruited me into his group, and I got to judge. Uh, unfortunately, I missed getting to hear uh, Connor speak because that was at the same time. But I was very, very impressed with these young men. I, as, as a preacher, uh, I got to sit, uh, sit beside Larry Acuff, and uh, he and I were judges in that same room together, and uh, I, was, I was encouraged. I was encouraged by these young men, and, and especially even just thinking about the, the future as far as who might go on to become gospel preachers. A uh, long time ago, 16, 17 years or so, uh, I spoke at Lads to Leaders, and that was, I suppose, I'm trying to think, I guess that would have been the first real speech, sermonette, if you will, that I had ever done. And now here I am preaching and so I was very encouraged by that. It was a lot of interesting and informative lessons. And, and I, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I, I don't want to re-preach these fellows' material, but I, I would really thought it was interesting. I wanted to look at some material from that, that theme. The theme was one. And I, the, these young men, they brought up things that I had not even really given much thought to when I, when I thought about the topic. And so it was very interesting things that they mentioned. Uh, I saw a couple of different uh, illustrations that I found on uh, Google images of, of different different takes people have on the one, but there there are basically three things that, that stuck out that I noticed as how these young men that I had the opportunity to hear approached it, and so I want to just play off that uh, a little bit and study this. One one thing that they talked about was one in the sense of one Lord, and going along with that one faith, uh, one one system of faith we might say. This this was illustrated time and time again. Uh, there is one Lord. In John 14, 6, Jesus says very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Of course, Acts 4, 12, uh, the apostles there, they're being called on the carpet, we might say. Why do you keep talking about this Jesus? You're trying to, <clears throat> you're trying to bring his blood upon us, and we don't appreciate that. And they said, there, there's not salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It was encouraging to hear these, these young men over and over again at Lads, uh, Lads to Leaders <clears throat> reinforcing the truth that Jesus is the one way to heaven. We live in such a pluralistic society that often wants to say, well, you know, you, you, you find your way to happiness, you find your way to heaven, you find your way to the Father, or what, whatever. You go your way, I go mine, that kind of thing. But Jesus himself, his apostles speaking by inspiration, it didn't allow for that. He is the way. And if we're going to go to heaven, it has to be through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 11, verse 25, well, 1 Timothy 2, 5 also comes to mind. I'm about to forget that. Uh, Jesus, Paul, right in there, he says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There, there's no way to have access. You see the illustration there with uh, Jesus Christ and the cross bridging that gap, the gap being, as it were, where sin separates us. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, we noted that this morning. <clears throat> sin separates us from God. And if we want to have access to the Father, there's only one way to do it, and that's through Jesus. That's not popular many times in the world today, but it is the truth. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And we've talked before about whether it be John 14, 6, same, same phrase in the Greek in John eleven twenty five, 25, but it's the idea literally could be translated, I and I only am the resurrection and the life. Uh, if you want to have eternal life, Jesus says it has to be through me. John 8, 24, we've noted that many times, where Jesus says, I said therefore unto you that you should die in your sins, <clears throat> for if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. Over and over and over again, the New Testament tells us there is but, but one way. But, you know, there, there's also just the one faith. And, and going to, turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. 
And I've made this point before, and I may have, I may have made it here, I don't recall. Specifically in, in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there is where we find, it's often referred to as the seven ones. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all <clears throat> and in you all. If I were to stand up here and start telling you, you know, I, I think you ought to have your own Lord. And, and, and if your Lord is different from my Lord, well, you know, who am I to judge? And if you wanted to go to heaven through Muhammad or if you wanted to go th to heaven through Buddha or some other means, you know, I mean, who, who am I to judge? People in here would be upset and rightfully so. And, and many people in the religious world would be upset and rightfully so. But why is it that we go in the same passage that says there's one Lord also says there's one body and one faith, one system of faith, doctrine, we might say. And people will say, well, you know, you, you, know, you, you can have your church and I can have mine and you're going to church your way and I don't, I don't necessarily agree with this, you don't necessarily agree with that, we're just going to heaven by different means. But the same passage that says one Lord, it says one God and Father of all, if I were to start talking about different gods, one of the young men in, uh, in the winter circle, it was, it was grades 10 to 12 uh, that I had the opportunity to judge, one of the young men began his speech with a very good illustration. He just started naming off these, these names, and you could tell they were some kind of Greek or Roman type names, and what it was, he was naming off different Greek gods, little g gods. They had a god for everything. And he even brought out they had a god for beans. They had a god for bread. You know, all kinds of things. You name it, they had a God for that. And so what if I started saying, you know, look, if you want to serve the God of beans, and you, you know, somebody over here wants to serve the God of bread, now who am I? I mean, who am I to judge? People would say, Chad, there's one God, and that's right. But my point in all that is the same passage that says that says there's one body, there's one faith, one system of faith. Why is it so easy to understand in real life and yet so difficult when it comes to spiritual matters? I, I submit to you it's not that difficult. I think sometimes it's, it's not always easy to come to terms with perhaps, but it's not difficult to understand. One young man even made that point. He, he began talking about, uh, this, this fellow was talking about his uh, girlfriend. He had a girlfriend, and he said, I, I could pick her out from a crowd. And he said, you men that are married, you could, you could go into a crowd of women, and you could find your wife because you know her. She's unique. Went on to make the point that the Lord's church is unique, and you could pick it out. Even in a crowd, as you look out in our world today and you see a crowd of denominationalism and all these different kinds of churches, you can pick out Christ's bride. And you better believe he can pick out his bride, and he will when he comes back. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus himself said, you know the verse, <clears throat> I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Peter just confessed that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said he was going to build his church, one church. I actually was uh, sort of laughing as, as the winter circle speeches began, uh, I actually was thinking about Rachel Wheeler giving me a hard time because one, uh, one young man, he brought up Lord of the Rings. That's how he started off his speech. Uh, and so I gave him high marks. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, he began with the illustration. He was talking about one. And the whole story centers around there's, there's one ring. You know, he, the, the, the dark Lord Sauron, he makes these nine rings for other folks. But, but in the end, there's just that one ring of power. And it controls all the others. And it can only be destroyed one way and one place. And, you know, it, on and on at the illustration showing there was just that one ring. And it was all powerful. He made a lot of different points from that, that that I won't make for time's sake. But he made a very powerful illustration from that. Very, very encouraging looking at people take that approach of one Lord and one faith. And several of the guys just in that room uh, that I had the opportunity to judge yesterday, made that point. But then there's another take that several people took on the theme one, and that is talking about the idea of Christian unity, being one as brothers and sisters. Uh, one young man, he, and in fact, he, he also began this way, a, a very powerful illustration, 
And he talked about, he said, picture yourself in a time when, you know, it's not, it's not you know, picture it like Roman times when there's not guns and things like that. But you're, you're, you're lined up, you're staring across what we often refer to as no man's land, and you see the enemy before you, and the, the sound comes to charge. And so you begin rushing into battle. And there you are, you're in no man's land, and you happen to glance over to your side, and you see your fellow soldier who's running with you all of a sudden, and you, look, you see he's swinging at you. And you come around, and you get your shield, and you're, you manage to deflect that blow, and you're, you're still reeling from shock, and you turn over here, and now on the other side, here's another guy, one of your soldiers, and he's attacking you now. He said, well, you know, you can imagine what a scene that would be. But this young man went on to point out that it happens a lot in the Lord's church, unfortunately. And sometimes it does. Paul said in Galatians 5.15, if you bite and devour, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. He said, if you have that mentality, you eventually will consume one another. An army that turns on each other, guess what? You don't have to go into battle against them. You just, just step back. Just wait and see. And they'll, they'll destroy each other. Christian unity is so important that Jesus prayed about it in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was going to die. We, we've, uh, we've studied, we've talked about the prayer of Jesus uh, not, not in the garden, still in the upper room there in John 17, rather. But he, he prayed for his disciples. And then in verses 20 and 21, he prays for you and me. Neither pray I for these, talking about the, the apostles, neither pray I for these alone, but for all them also which shall believe on me through their, the apostles' word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us. Why, Jesus? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Christian unity. One young man in the song leading, uh, I went in there to uh, hear, I believe it was when I got, got in there to hear Levi, he led the song, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. We're one in the spirit, it starts off, we're one in the Lord. But it's the idea that when we are unified in Christ, it says to the world, there's a God. He is real. Jesus is a savior and he's called us to be one and so we're going to do that. We're we're not all exactly alike. We don't all like exactly the same things and have the same opinions about everything, but we're one in the Lord. And I love this graphic that I found because it says unity, unity comes by getting on the same page with God. You know, a bunch of us could get together and decide we're just going to ignore what the Bible says. A bunch of us could get together and just decide we're going to start saying that the Bible's completely false and we could be unified but, but that's not true unity that God desires. True unity is getting on the same page with God. We've, we've pointed out before there's a difference in union and unity. We want to be unified as, as God would have us to be unified. Turn, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul deals with this with the church at Corinth. Really, there's so much that we could say about Christian unity, but, but just notice a couple of these for time's sake. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I believe the same young man that I mentioned that used the illustration of the soldiers went to this verse and made a, made a strong point from this. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the, are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? All rhetorical questions, of course, the answer is, is no. Christ is not divided. Paul was not crucified for you. You were not baptized in the name of Paul. And, and he's not downgrading baptism or downplaying baptism there, like sometimes people go to this passage and try to do. He's just saying, stop being divided. Stop calling yourself by some man's name and unite on Jesus Christ. Unite in Christ. That's what he's saying. When you get over to chapter 3, it's just the opposite page in my Bible. He says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. And he says, why in verse 3? For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and Divisions. Are you not carnal 
and walk as men. They were just filled with division. And so it's hard to talk about one and miss this point that God calls his people to be one. He never asks us to compromise with error. He never asks us to, as the old saying goes sometimes, go along to get along. We must unite on the truth. True unity is getting on the same page as God. Now, <clears throat> to look at that from a little bit different angle, turn to Acts chapter 2. We looked at it from the, from the negative aspect, I guess you could call it, but, but I want to look at it from a positive standpoint. Acts 2, beginning at verse 42, you know the verses. They continued steadfastly. This is at the establishment of the church on the first day of Pentecost after the resurrection. <clears throat> they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Then you can drop down to Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. By the way, we often point out in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, or, or some versions have the Lord added to the church day by day those who are saved. And that, that's, that's valid, and we point out that you can't join the church and Jesus adds you to it. But did you notice where that verse happens? It's right there in the context of here's people who are just, they've just become members of the body of Christ, and they're unified. You want to grow? Be unified. That's the lesson we learn from that. Philippians 1.27, the last part of that verse, Paul says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He says, whether I come see you or whether I be absent, I want to hear that you're striving together for the faith of the gospel. These young men, even some, like I said, some of them were as young as 10th grade. The oldest would have been 12th. But they pressed the point very firmly, very effectively, using the Bible to show God expects his people to be one and God expects us to respect the fact that there is one Lord and one system of faith, one way to get to heaven. And that is through Jesus Christ and his body, the church. But then there was another take on it that I thought was very interesting, and that is the oneness, the, the idea of one person making a difference. I love this, this quote, uh, you know, anyone who, who feels too small to make a difference has never spent the night in a tent with a mosquito. <laughs> um, boy, isn't that the truth? You know, you, you sometimes feel insignificant. You, you feel like, what, what can I do? I even read a quote recently, and I, I thought it was uh, it, it really one of those that just makes you stop and think. And the, it was a, one of those pictures somebody had shared on Facebook, and it said, this this. It's something that we parents ought to take to heart. It said, the most important thing you do for the kingdom of God, or your most important contribution to the kingdom of God, rather, may not be something you do, but someone you raise. That's, that's deep. Your most important thing may not even be something that you do for the kingdom of God. But do you think about, it's one of the things that when I read um, the biography for, Marshall Keeble, Roll, Jordan, Roll, my brother Shote. It, it, it's, it's a longer biography than some of the other ones that folks have done on Brother Keeble because he goes so far back before Keeble's time. But you see the background of sort of what helped make Keeble who he is or who he was, and we don't often recognize those people. We don't, many of the names I'd never even heard of, but they were people who had a tremendous influence on him and helping to him to become the gospel preacher that we know him as now. One young man mentioned about during the Civil War, and there was a, there was a soldier who went off and fought, and I, I don't remember which side he fought for, but he came home and his sweetheart was a member of the body of Christ. He was not. 
And she was determined that she was going to teach him the gospel. And she did, and she helped him to become a Christian. And then he went on, and he baptized a man by the name of Gus Nichols. And Gus Nichols, uh, no, nobody knows for sure like with Brother Keeble, but some, some people have estimated 10, 15, 20,000 people obeyed the gospel because of that man's efforts. We sometimes don't remember the other folks. In, in other words, what I'm saying with all that is it's easy to feel like, well, what am I doing in my little corner of the world? I think some, sometimes we have to fight those feelings. But don't ever feel that way because one person can make a difference. I thought about Tate a lot. Tate would have loved it. Uh, you know, he, had, he, he often, I heard Tate a number of times preach uh, his sermon, just one man. God's looking for just one man and the difference that one can make. And I think about just, just a few examples that came to my mind. Some of these were used by, by the young men uh, doing their, their various lessons. Noah. Noah is just, just one man that comes to mind. Uh, you know, Noah kept humanity alive. If Noah had decided that he wasn't going to be faithful and he hadn't followed God, where would humanity be? Just one person. And he says, we're going to follow the Lord. And so he kept humanity alive. I think about uh, a Abraham. God used Abraham to bring in the Messiah. Just one person. But God chose him. And through the lineage of Abraham came the Messiah. One person. I think about Joseph. Boy, there, there's an example of one person making a difference. Joseph, you know, we, we could talk a lot about the providence in Joseph's life and how he ends up in Egypt. But if Joseph's not in Egypt, he doesn't interpret the Pharaoh's dream and he's not promoted and he's not put in charge of, he makes them aware, here comes the famine, it's going to come. During those seven years of plenty, who knows? Maybe they think, boy, this is great. We're, we're just being blessed, and, and, and they're just consuming grain right and left. And then when the lean years hit, uh-oh. But because Joseph is there, God's using him. Joseph says, you better store up. You better save up. And because of that, Jacob and his sons, including Judah, that seed line of the Messiah, were saved. Just that one man. You see what a difference he made. I also think about Daniel. We've been studying about Daniel on Wednesday nights. Now, you think one man can't make a difference? Here's a slave boy. He's just been taken into slavery, put in the king's court, and he's just made to serve. Doesn't give up on God, though. And he even changes a king. You know, we noticed that last Wednesday night. No reason I can find to believe Nebuchadnezzar's conversion there in chapter 4 is not 100% sincere. And if it was, then you look at that and you think, can one man make a difference? He changed a king. He helped change a king. That's pretty amazing. I think about Esther. I don't want to say too much about Esther, quite honestly, because that's the book of the month. And I might take away my material that night. So, um, but, you know, we're all familiar with the story of Queen Esther and how she helped save her people from extinction. Haman and the, and the uh, others, they were going to wipe out the Jews, but she saved them. And I think about, as I mentioned, Tate's sermon, he would often quote from Ezekiel 22:30, where God says, I sought for a man, sought for a man to stand in the gap. But unfortunately, in Ezekiel's time, he said, I couldn't find one. There wasn't anybody there willing to take a stand for what was right. One man perhaps could have spared that nation if he'd have stood up for what was right. But it's easy for us to think, too, I believe. Well, you know, you talk about Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Daniel, Esther even. I mean, Esther was a queen, right? And Daniel, you know, very shortly after arriving, at least within a couple, three years of arriving in Babylon, he, he achieves this elevated status. And, you know, I, I'm certainly not on a par with those people. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but let, just in case we get to feeling that way, I wanted to pick out a few people that maybe we're not as familiar with. And so some people that we might think of as pretty insignificant, but that made a big difference. One of them is a little Israelite maid. 2 Kings chapter 5. If you want to turn there, we can look at 2 Kings chapter 5 and read about this young girl. You know about Naaman. Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because... 
By him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And you no doubt know about Elisha, who he ends up going to to be healed. And you probably know about Gehazi, Elisha's servant, who, for whatever reason, became overcome with greed. And he decided to go after Naaman after Elisha had told him, I don't want your gifts. I'm not here to, I'm not, I'm not taking any gifts from you. This was not done to make me rich. This is so you will know there's a God in Israel and that he's the God. Gehazi goes after him and says, change your plans, change your plans. We can go ahead, we'll give us some of your money and your riches. And, and of course, Naaman gladly did so. And Gehazi ended up leprous till the day of his death. You, you, no doubt you know about all three of those, but we often pass over this poor little girl, don't we? I mean, just a nobody. She has been captured. The Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel. Verse 2, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And you know what she says to her mistress? Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. You know what she knew? She knew there was one God, and that God could heal him. And she knew Naaman could go to his false gods all day long, and they couldn't do anything because they're just idols and they're powerless. And she said, I wish he was with the prophet in Israel because he could heal him. She could very easily have just said, I wish, I wish Naaman would hurry up and die, and then maybe there might be a chance I could get free. I, I'm not concerned about him. They took me captive. No, she said, there's a God, and he can heal you. And that's the, that's the whole point of 2 Kings 5. It's not, it's not just about a man being healed of leprosy. It's about Naaman, Syria, the world, understanding and knowing there is a God. He's alive. He's not, a, he's not a dead, deaf, dumb, blind idol that has to be placed here or placed there. He's alive, and he is able. And they learned it. Why? Because a little Israelite maid spoke up. Now, don't tell me you're too insignificant to make a difference. I think about Mordecai. We often talk about Esther, but what about Mordecai? Or some people call it Mordecai. I don't know how you exa exactly correct pronunciation is Esther was ready to just say call it in and say I can't go into the king but because if I if I'm not called in to see the king then I could lose my life you know the, you, you go in if you're not called and if, if it's okay he'll extend the scepter but if he doesn't you're, you're going to end up dead because you don't go see the king the king calls for you and then you go see him And Mordecai says, look, God's going to save his people. And if you don't do this, salvation is going to come from somewhere else. But he says, who knows? But maybe God put you here just for this purpose. Little Jewish girl that ends up queen. Is that a coincidence, Esther? Or has God put you here for a purpose? And you know what she said because of Mordecai? She said, okay, you're right. I'm going in there. And if I die, I die. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mordecai, not somebody we think of as great. What about a man named Jethro? No, not the one that became a millionaire. What about Moses' father-in-law, Jethro? That's all I can ever think of when I first hear that name, so let's just get that out of the way. Uh, Moses' father-in-law, rule. That's another name for him. Maybe that'd be easier to, to think of him that way. In Exodus chapter 18, he comes and Moses is judging everything. And, and he says to Moses, what you're doing is not good. You are going to burn out. That's essentially what he says. You're going to burn out fast. He says, what you need to do is captains over a thousand, captains over hundreds, captains over fifties. And, and let them handle the small things. And if there's something really big, really major... Then it comes to you. It's kind of like, you know, Moses was sort of like the Supreme Court. And, and then you can go and speak to God on their behalf and, and find the right answer to this. But you're going to burn out if you keep doing this. Now, that's, you know, that just may not seem like too much. But, I mean, without Jethro doing that, suppose Moses burns out. 
You think he had a little bit more work ahead of him there at that point? Quite a bit. And if he burns out, that's not accomplished. Jethro is not somebody we would think of as some kind of huge person in the Bible, huge character, really significant, but he played a significant role. I think about going back to the, uh, going back to the illustration that the, the young man used with, uh, or well, I'm about to forget this one, but one, one young man, this was actually in Josh Chapman and Joshua's uh, session. One of the young men gave the illustration, I've, I've, I think I've heard this before, but about a storm and all the starfish wash up on the shore. And this, this young fella goes out and he's, he's grabbing starfish that have washed up on the shore and he's flinging them back out in the ocean because they're going to die if they just sit out there on the beach. And so somebody comes along and says, what are you doing? And he says, well, these starfish are out here and they, they've washed ashore in that storm and they're going to die if, if they don't get back in the ocean. So I'm throwing them back in. And he says, son, look, look down this beach. There are miles of starfish. He said, you really think you can make a difference? And the young man smiled and he reached over and he picked up a starfish and he slung it into the ocean. And he said, I made a difference to that one. And he picked up another one and he slung it into the ocean. He said, it made a difference to that one. If you can only influence one person, you make a difference to that person. And what did Jesus say? And profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? One soul is worth more than the entire world to our Lord. But as I was mentioning, going back to the, the, the Lord of the Rings illustration that the young man mentioned, one of the things in that, that story by J.R.R. Tolkien, which of course was made into movies, is that one of the most insignificant people that you would have thought of, there were these great warriors among men and warriors among elves and other folks uh, that, that you would have thought that somebody's going to be the hero and, 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 you know, destroy the ring and it would be them. But it's this little hobbit, Frodo Baggins. And he goes and he is the one who ends up fulfilling this quest. Sometimes the most insignificant people, seemingly insignificant people, can make the biggest difference. As we close our thoughts tonight, again, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged I'm very impressed by the young men that I had the opportunity to to hear, and I was very much edified as well by the things that they said because they they made several points about one. One Lord, and we must obey the one Lord. We need to be added to his one church. We we talked this morning and and other times about what it it means to be, be a Christian. It's not just calling him Lord, Lord, but it's believing in Christ, giving your life to him in repentance, confessing his name as Lord, and being immersed in water to have your sins washed away. In fact, the idea of oneness is right there in Romans 6, 3, and 4 that we often talk about when we talk about baptism, being baptized into his death. But right there, the very next verse, verse 5, he says, For if we have been planted together, that's the idea of oneness, in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. There's one Lord, and we need to obey him if we hope to go to heaven. He has but one body, the church. We need to be one with our brethren. And then as a Christian, whether you think you're significant or insignificant, understand that even as one person, you can make a difference. One young man gave the illustration. I thought it was also a pretty powerful illustration. He said he walked in one morning. I believe he said it was a Monday morning. And the teacher gave him a test. Well, he knew the test was coming. He had studied, he had prepared, and he said, then the grade came back, and it was a C (laughs) minus. And he said, I don't know what happened, but I was devastated. I I, had tried so hard, and I'd put forth all that effort, but then the teacher announced there was going to be a redo, and they could retake the test, and he was able to do so, and I actually wanted to ask that young man what he made on the redo. He never told us. But when it comes to life, you know, we all fail at some point or another. And Christ comes along and he says, if you're alive and if you're able, you can have a do-over, as we sometimes say, or a mulligan or a redo, however you want to word that. He says, you can have forgiveness. But we have to take advantage of it while we're on this earth and able because Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. One death... And there's one judgment after that. No more do-overs, no more retries or anything 
after we leave this life. And so if you're not right with the Lord, maybe you're not a Christian, you need to become one with the Lord. Maybe as a child of God, you've gone astray and you need to come back to your first love, the one true God, the one true Savior. That's why heaven's invitation is extended. We bid you come, the Lord bid you come, as we stand and sing to encourage you. Thankful to all that a public part in our worship today, especially Chad and those fine lessons. Brother Johnny leading our singing this morning, the good crowd we had, and also Brother Steve tonight. Please take a moment, if you were not here this morning, fill out an attendance card, leave that with one of us as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit with us. Remind you of those on our prayer list, Sister Frida Gray continues at Tanner and Carrollton. She's now in room 170-170 after her uh, hip replacement redo. Florian King has some surgery upcoming, some major back surgery, but it'll be this coming Wednesday, April the 8th, at Atlanta Medical Center. Al Jones has uh, had some tests, and he has some results pending tomorrow. So he asked us to remember he and Janice as they're awaiting those test results. You're also asked to remember Rob Whitaker's mother, Kathy Whitaker, who is not doing well. He asked us to remember her. Also, Brother Eddie Brinkley, who had some recent health troubles. We understand he had a heart cath, but we're hopeful that he is doing some better. Are there any others that we should mention? Also, last Sunday, Leroy had mentioned that good news today. Many of you may be familiar with that broadcast. It's been on GBN for years, but it's also on various cable outlets. Good news today begins tonight on Channel 57 in Atlanta. We have made a monetary contribution to help put that on the air, but it will be at 10.30 this evening. So hopefully that will be on Channel 57 for a long time to come. But Good News Today is a news format type uh, sound uh, gospel broadcast, and we're encouraging you to tune that in, Channel 57 tonight. If you're not up to watch it, tape it. Watch it a little bit later, 10.30 will be getting this evening on Channel 57. <laughs> Camp and Gay has a 5K race that will be coming up Saturday, May the 2nd. If you have an interest in that, please see Brother Johnny. 
The Daddy Daughter Tea Party will be Friday week, April the 17th. There's a sign up sheet in the foyer. Our next event here at Bremen is coming on us pretty quickly. It's uh, two weeks from today. It begins April the 19th. It's our spring gospel meeting. That Saturday before the 18th, we're planning on having a door knocking, trying to come canvas the city of Bremen. If you wish to help in that effort, we would highly encourage you to be part of it. Brother Tim Lowe will be heading up that effort, and we're hopeful that we have a lot of folks to help us on that Saturday morning get out and make sure folks know in addition to other things that we might be doing, newspaper and so forth, to let folks know about our gospel meeting. We have some flyers, or if we don't, we'll get some more, some flyers in the foyer to help advertise that event. We'll have a potluck after that Sunday morning, and we're looking forward to that. But Ed White will be the speaker, and we know that the gospel will be preached, and he will do a fine job. Brothers Keepers Group 4, Brian and Rachel's group, will meet Fellowship Hall that following Sunday, April the 26th, after the evening service. There's some gospel meetings that are coming up in the area. If you want to know specifically each one, they're advertised here in the uh, hallway on the bulletin board, one in particular at the South Cobb congregation, where the Kyle Butt will be speaking the weekend before our meeting starts. It starts on Friday, April the 17th, so it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. But if you have yet to hear Brother Butt in person, what a treat. If he's this close, we need to take advantage of it. South Cobb, Kyle Butt, April the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. And once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Our next service will be Wednesday at 7, and we hope to see each of you at that time. Should we mention anything else? Final song, brother. 138. I see it right here. 138. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. We'll sing the first and last verse. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here today to be a part of this service. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you heard our prayers and our worship service. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll answer our prayers as you see fit. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we go out in the community now, and into our work week that will be the right examples that will lead others to you. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that <coughs> we have men here who are teaching the young girls and boys how to become great Christians and great leaders. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless them. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>